tænkt sig til, hold da op. Hvor er I lækre og fulde? Er I fulde? Ærligt? Ja, nej, okay. Jeg døjer også lidt med noget på stemmen, sådan noget, noget ramadan. Jeg, jeg døjer med noget ramadan. Hvad hedder det? Ja, jeg ved, hvordan det er. Hvad hedder det? Hvor er det dejligt, virkelig dejligt at se øh, så mange øh, prioritere den her vigtige talk. Det glæder virkelig sådan en, en gammel øh, bøsserøv som mig. Det er virkelig godt, og, og, at, de, øh, at de gider det. Jeg har også selv glædet mig til og sige velkommen til den her Future Talk, som vi altså har valgt at rykke ind i det store telt, og det har mange af jer opdaget, og jeg kan se, at det var en god øh, prioritering. Fordi øh, Judith Butler er en af vores vigtigste og øh, ind, mest indflydelsesrige feministiske tænkere. Hun har provokeret mange gennem øh, de senere år for sine analyser af vores øh, køn og seksualitet, og for at sige, at øh, vores seksualitet ikke, ikke er en naturlig følge af vores køn. Det er begge er noget, vi så at sige performer. Hun er dag professor ved Berkeley University of California, og denne her talk vil blive styret af den dygtige journalist og tv-vært Lotte Folke, og bliver naturligvis på engelsk. Last time Judith Butler was here in Denmark was actually over 10 years ago, and she was just here visiting, so she hasn't held a speech um, in, in many years in, here in, uh, in, in Denmark. So this is actually a, an exclusive event that we are very proud of, and that Heartland Festival have been working on for several years. So it is truly uh, an honor for me to welcome to the stage Judith Butler with Lotte Folke, ladies and gentlemen. I told you it's nice in here. <laughs> Judith Butler, professor, queer theorist, feminist, philosopher, thinker. I consider myself licensed to call you an icon and perhaps my final confirmation of this came just a few days ago. I saw a quote in a magazine from a libertarian conservative politician, a member of parliament. And he said, anything that has anything at all to do with Judith Butler in any way is pseudoscience. It's nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, if only I were a thinker so iconic, so dangerous, that just the mention of my name was enough to conjure up a demon that large and in such a screaming need of the Inquisition, I would be a happy person. And maybe we'll return to the demonic later on, but we're here to talk about the future of gender politics. And I know, Judith Butler, that you've agreed to this topic because uh, you are interested in talking about the future for all of us. And my first question to you is about how the future comes about. And that's because you, I think, like few other living thinkers, uh, are a thinker who has children or whose thoughts have children. I see those children at my kids' school. I see them in the younger generation. And what I see is younger generations who have freed the, themselves of traditional gender stereotypes in a way that was unthinkable in my time and probably unthinkable for a long, long time. So tell us first, which change or perhaps even progress in gender's role in society makes you the happiest to see or perhaps even the proudest? Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be in conversation with you, and um, I'm very thrilled to be here. Thank you, all of you, for coming out today. Um, I uh, Well, let me say first um, that I think my name uh, is more dangerous than me. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's true that some of the people who fear my name fear um, Uh, that I will uh, somehow, through magical powers, um, liberate everyone from uh, 
the restrictions of sex or the, um, the inhibitions of sexuality and that um, people will be suddenly free to remake themselves in whatever um, uh, gender they wish or uh, to have um, sexuality that will um, know no restraints, that will be radically uninhibited. Um, and, and, and of course, this is a fantasy. It's somebody else's fantasy, it's not my fantasy. Um, in my own experience, it seems to me uh, that many people are in a struggle with um, the gender assignment that they have been given at birth, with the expectations of what it is to be a girl or a boy, a woman or a man. Um, many young children and adolescents are fearful of whether they, um, whether they uh, conform to norms that will make them socially acceptable, whether they will be ostracized or stigmatized in schools or um, in their communities if they do not conform to expectations of gender. So it's that experience of fear and anxiety, um, the fear of being excluded, the anxiety of being found wanting, being, being found to be not enough, to be living under norms that sometimes feel very alien and very um, oppressive. So my question really is how do any of us, um, at whatever age we are, and I still have these questions at my age, how do any of us um, move and breathe in the world without fear of being discriminated against or being an object of violence? Uh, how many of us are able to move in and out of institutions, whether it's the workplace or the school or religious institutions, and feel that the way in which we live our gender is, per is not just permissible, but affirmed, right? And so it's worried me for a very long time that young people live with fear and conflict and are not always able to say what works for them and what does not. Um, um, and, and very often, um, it, uh, it seems to me that those who belong to the world of, well, I don't know if it's science or if it's the world of common sense or traditional community, they don't understand why anybody would have a problem being a girl or being a boy. Why do they want another category? Or why do they want to transform that category in a way that proves to be more livable, more easy for them to live in? And the truth is that, of course, we belong to communities, we belong to any number of institutions where we want to be able to be accepted, to live in a way um, without fear um, and without shame and without guilt, simply for uh, appearing as we do or loving as we do. <laughs> These are very simple concepts. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. Um, very simple concepts. Why should it be that if somebody walks a certain way, they're discriminated against? Well, boys don't walk that way, or girls don't walk that way. Or if somebody appears in clothing that doesn't conform to their gender assignment, why would that be a problem? Why can't this, that be a small and beautiful space of freedom, right? Why wouldn't we want that for our children? But it's a, it's a long answer to your question. But the truth is, it is very often a struggle. It's a struggle for young people. It's a struggle for people at all ages to come to terms with what's expected of them. You very often have to disappoint your parents or alarm them or confuse them or hear their anger or lose their support, right? You can lose economic support. Um, if, you are, if you are honest about how you want to live in this world, with whom you want to live, how you want to love, what is the nature of your desire, how you want to move and breathe and appear, basics for living. But, but the cost can be very high. So it's a struggle. It's not, 
It's not an act of radical self-creation with no consequences, hardly. Um, and it is easier to do when we live in communities that support us and where other people are involved in their own ways of living and transforming their lives. So, um, I don't know. I mean, I suppose, I believe, um, I'm not sure I think we can create ourselves radically at every moment. I, I don't believe that we have that power. We're constrained by history, by all kinds of psychological complexities and social pressures, but we can struggle and find our way and negotiate a, a space for greater social and political freedom and recognition for the communities that who have formed, whether it's feminist community, LGBTQ communities, the important trans community. We have to have alliances among feminists and queer people and trans people, right? We don't need those fights. We're already, we already have enough people fighting with us. We don't need those fights among ourselves, right? <laughs> So there are struggles going on in which people keep also redefining ways of claiming their identities. Um, but you stressed in Politiken, the Danish newspaper, in an interview yesterday, that that struggle or that redefinition or that access to defining identity is not in your eyes necessarily the same as what is called identity politics which is often uh, used for the idea that by right of, for instance, a minority identity, you uh, can claim a sort of representation that is given, um, that, that you have sort of the right to because others have spoken for too long. Can you just say, uh, what's the difference between what you're talking about and identity poli politics? Well, you know, the accusation of identity politics has always been somewhat strange to me um, because the largest identity politics movement in the world is that of white men who think they should keep their privilege on the basis of being white men. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's, it's the right wing that is talking about identity, generation identity, European identity, white supremacy as our identity, you know, this is, this is, this is where it's happening. Okay, so that's, that's an identity politics. What's, cu what's curious to me, like, let's say we accept a basic claim about democracy that all people should be treated equally regardless of where they come from, what religion they practice, what gender they are, or what sexuality they have. Um, if we then say not all people are treated equally, look, here are these marginalized groups that are not being treated equally, we're accused of identity politics. But why aren't we being accused of being people who want radical equality for everyone, right? I mean. <laughs> The, the point is to struggle for equality. It's not just to assert an identity. One asserts an identity because it has been disparaged and because one suffers a lack of freedom and a, and a lack of equality, and one is searching for freedom, one is searching for equality, one is searching for belonging and recognition as all other people are. So we're trying to break into the universal. <laughs> the universal has not included us. Um, we have to name our identities in order to achieve our freedom, our equality, our justice. But I think there's, um, there's an understanding of uh, what is called, uh, I agree not usually by people who love it, what is called uh, identity politics and uh, what you do, and it has to do with the question of what is ide identity? Is there a given identity that then struggles for more space to itself, you know, be it a sexual minority, an ethnic minority or other? Or is there, as you say, a struggle or a, a querying of identity, a deconstruction of what constitutes the basic sort of pillars of your identity? Aren't those two different ways of going about that question? <coughs> um, well, Let's remember, um, 
for, for a young feminist, for a young trans person, for a young queer person, they're being told too often that something is wrong with them, right? Something's wrong with your personality. Something's wrong with the way you're acting. The focus is on regulating and disciplining that identity so that it becomes normalized. And so it is precisely by claiming, no, there's nothing wrong with who I am, that we make the point against pathology. We make the point against cri criminalizing uh, uh, se sexual minorities. We make the point against um, modes of uh, behavior modification that seek to cure us of our, our, our um, lesbianism or our gay sexuality. I mean, it starts, it starts in a different place. It starts precisely through criminalization and pathologization. And the resistance does take the form of a strong affirmation of identity. But, but think about it. What are we asking for? Not just to be this identity that I am, but to live in a world in which nobody is pathologized on the basis of their desire, as long as it really, truly hurts no one, right? So we can, we, you know, in, ca in cases of rape or pedophilia, we do condemn that, and we must condemn that. So it's not every possible desire, but it seems to me that the day is, is, is over when you can pathologize uh, homosexuality without finding a resistance movement at your doorstep, right? I mean, this, this day is over. We're not going back. We're not going back. There's no way. So, um, but look, we want to live in a world in which people can, everybody can, regardless of what their sexuality is, live freely in their desire, right? Not feel shame about their basic desire, how they want to be intimate with others, how they want to make contact with others, how they want to live their sexual life in their body, um, especially, especially when it actually causes no pain. I mean, it causes pain if you fall in love with your friend's girlfriend, I, you know, you fall, it it's causes pain if somebody breaks up with you. I mean, there is pain, you know, a lot of pain, enough pain in interpersonal relations, don't get me wrong. But the point is, is that nobody needs to suffer judgment on the basis of their, of, of their desire. And that should be true for all people. That should be a principle that everybody accepts, that heterosexuals also accept. And heterosexuals also suffer from, from from all kinds of sexual issues, perhaps shame, perhaps they also are not living a normative heterosexual life as a, hom as a heterosexual. There are ways of queering heterosexuality. People have to be in the closet about that until they're not, right? So what I um, think is really important that you were kind of saying, if I understand you right, is that this is also about achieving a commonality. This is, this is about us uh, understanding one another rather than giving up on understanding one another. This is not about sort of saying, you will never understand this because you don't have this experience. Um, well, I guess my, my point is is this, I think our question has to be, what kind of world do we want to live in together? And do we want to live in a world in which people feel fear and persecution on the basis of their desire or their gender presentation? Or do all of us want to live in a world in which, which nobody feels that fear? And it seems to me we can commit to that, even though we have different experiences of sexuality and gender, but we can commit to wanting to live in that world in which persecution is alleviated for everyone. I think it's a better world. And, and let me say this, let me say this as well. I mean, when, um, when racial, religious, ethnic minorities make their own cultural values clear or seek to establish their own space or want their history to be known or want their religion to be understood, it seems to me that we all make space for that and we affirm that 
um, not because we're eager to recognize everybody's identity, we might be, um, but because we want to live in a world that is opposed to racism, that is opposed to discrimination on the basis of religion, and we see that the marginalization and silencing of people on the basis of their race or their religion produces an, an, a radical inequality. We fight against inequality, we fight against racism, no matter who we are, right? I mean, white men are more than welcome to join that struggle. And it happens. <laughs> so Judith Butler, you, you just uh, talked about making a world in which uh, a number of things happen. But there are also people who think that the world that they used to know is disappearing, that they are losing the natural world, that they're use, losing the world as it should be. And um, to understand uh, a little bit about that thinking, uh, let's just watch a comment uh, made a couple of years ago by uh, the very popular Pope, Pope Francis, and it's clip number three. Le domandò al, al ragazzo di dieci anni, e tu cosa vuoi fare quando diventi grande? Ragazza! Il papà se ne è accorto che nei libri dei collegi si insegnava la teoria del gender. E questo è contro le cose naturali. Una cosa è che una persona abbia questa tendenza, questa opzione e anche chi cambia il sesso. E un'altra cosa è fare l'insegnamento nelle scuole su questa linea per cambiare la mentalità. A questo io chiamo colonizzazioni ideologiche. Per favore non dite il Papa santificherà i trans, per favore, perché io vedo i copetti dei giornali, no, no. C'è qualche dubbio in quello che ho detto, voglio essere chiaro. È un problema di morale. Non è un problema, è un problema umano. E si deve risolvere come si può, sempre con la misericordia di Dio. Yeah, con la misericordia di Dio. So, Judith Butler, what's, uh, what's going on here? Well, first of all, um, I, I, I believe that Pope Francis has made some great uh, progress. Uh, and has tried to move the Catholic Church to um, become uh, a more open institution. He, um, you know, he comes from uh, Argentina where he was very influenced by liberation theology and he has always said that one should read the Bible through the eyes of the poor Um, and that was, I think, a very radical step for a pope uh, to, to make. Um, he's been more open about women. He's been, he has still to make some significant s steps in eradicating um, uh, molestation from the church and holding um, church authorities responsible for that. Um, and on the issue of gender, um, He has an understanding which he has taken from the prior pope, Pope Benedict, uh, who was also on the family council uh, for the, the papacy prior to uh, becoming the pope. And that view is that um, gender denies the natural differences between the sexes. And of course, gender is a strange word. It's an English word, so it's already colonization. 
colonization from the urban centers of the north. Um, uh, ge gender is um, the cultural meaning that a sexed body assumes in the course of its life and its history and in society. So, um, according to um, the biblical doctrine that the Pope accepts, when you're born with a sex, um, you're assigned a sex, you um, are assumed to have an unambiguous sex at birth, which is, by the way, not true for many people. Um, it then follows what, that you will be heterosexual, that you will be married, that you will reproduce within marriage, and that a woman's life will, will have a different track than a man's life, um, and that her proper functions in society will be determined by that sex, rather than by her choice or changing cultural and social norms. So it is true that Simone de Beauvoir and feminist theory from the beginning said, biology is not destiny. Your social destiny does not follow from your biology. It doesn't mean that all biological differences are denied. No, there are biological differences. I mean, there, there will be people who say, Butler says, I can see the headlines now, to quote him, I can see the headlines <laughs> now. Oh, she doesn't think there are any biological differences. What interests me, though, is how those biological differences are interpreted even within science, right? Um, and there are many feminists who've been working in the history of science who can show us how certain kinds of ways of understanding sex are built into scientific hypotheses. And that's a cultural prejudice that sometimes guides our work, I even in thinking about biological differences. But look, my point is this, um, that when we teach gender in the schools, what we try to do for young people is to say, look, there are different options open for you. You should imagine, you should experiment, you should think about your life. There's not one track for you. You may want a traditional track. It, you may want traditional masculinity. You may want traditional femininity. You may want to affirm that, great. But here, here is, here are the possibilities in the world, and here's the way we think about it. Most um, efforts to teach gender in the school for children um, are designed to stop bullying, to stop uh, kids who are non-gender conforming from being persecuted by their classmates or by their teachers or by the school curriculum. So it's a, it's a pedagogy that puts acceptance um, at its center. Um, but gender theory does not prescribe. In other comments that the Pope has made and that the church has made, it's imagined that gender, if you teach gender, then you're teaching, you're teaching a child how to be a homosexual, or you're teaching a child how to masturbate. It's like, I don't know. I don't think children need to be taught how to masturbate. I, <laughs> and, and I don't think homosexuality is teachable. I mean, in the sense like, oh, first you do this, then you do this, and then you will become a homosexual. It's like, no, it doesn't work like that. Desire doesn't work like that. Most desire is uneducable, right? That's, that's my basic view. But no, it's not prescriptive. It's about opening up a world of possibilities and, and enhancing a sense of experimentation and imagining for a, for, a, for a young person who may be trying to find their way. Um, and there's nothing wrong with a kid, with, if you ask a, ki a kid, a boy, what do you want to be when you grow up, and he says, a girl, that's the beginning of a very interesting conversation, <laughs> right? So and why do you want to be a girl? Well, they get to wear that, well, what can girls do, and what kind of girl would you be, and what would you call yourself, and let's talk about that, and maybe that kid wants to talk about that for five minutes, or maybe three months, or maybe that kid wants to talk about it for a lifetime. But that's a conversation to find out something about the imaginative life of that child. And I think that imaginative life should be allowed to have its way and not be shut down too early.
I was just thinking that there's almost a funny reversal of roles here because you're supposed to be the constructionist. You say we're making a world and here you are talking about sort of allowing uh, the child to say that he wants to be a girl. And then we have the Pope, the defender of the natural order. And apparently the natural order is so weak that uh, a teaching in school is going to sort of tear it down. So it's almost as if he He's the constructionist. <laughs> well, maybe, although he thinks of constructionism as, as, um, um, as the means by which human beings take the power away from God, right? God alone can create, and he creates us male and female. And then we come along and say, well, actually, I would like to do a little more creating. <laughs> And, and when we do that, we're apparently stealing God's power and we're destroying what God has made. But even within theology, if you will excuse me, I'm not actually against theology, by the way. Um, but even within theology, I mean, it's always been an interesting paradox. Why is, why is it that even a monotheistic God would create people free? We are free to make decisions. We have moral dilemmas as humans. We, we do not simply accept how we are made. We also have an obligation and a pleasure to make ourselves, to form our lives. And the question is, do we form our lives with support uh, or do we form our lives um, uh, in a fight against those who would uh, stop us from living? and sometimes do take away our lives on the basis of our gender or our sexuality. So that's uh, theology, but the Pope isn't the only one thinking about these questions and wondering what our kids should be taught in school. And I will show you another example, and it's from uh, the Brazilian, he's now the president, Jair yeah, Bolsonaro. He, but yeah, he's my best friend. <laughs> He's a great friend of Judith Butler. Um, no, this is from before he was elected. He uh, had a very efficient uh, electoral campaign, which, uh, among other things, uh, cons consisted very much of clips on YouTube. We're going to show you one, and it's not super quality, but uh, it's also about teaching gender in school, and I hope you can sort of make out what's going on. So let's just watch clip number two, please. Continua nesse livro aqui. Todo ele é, um, é uma coletânea de absurdos que estimula precocemente as Sorry, crianças I... a se interessarem por sexo. E no... There's supposed to be one with subtitles. I mean, I know you all speak Portuguese, but we don't, <laughs> we don't have that. Okay, can we maybe just show it without the sound and I'll just explain what's going on in the clip? Is that an option? Okay. So this is Jair Bolsonaro. He's uh, showing a s sex and gender education book from school. And there's a hole down in the bottom right corner. And he's going to stick his finger in that hole. And he wants to shock you because, as you see on the next page, turns into a penis. And, um, and he's, a I mean, he's not laughing, I just want to say. Uh, um, and then there's a, a female figure, and she also has a whole, actually like the male figure. <laughs> and you might say, I mean, who would, you might just have put your finger in the other way, but he says, so this is like, um, he says it's pedophilia because it's being taught in school and, and children shouldn't know about this. Then he shows this folder, and he says, this is the party of Lula, and it's about uh, LBTQ. LGBTQ rights, it's about uh, what Butler was just talking about, sort of uh, teaching children to accept each other's differences even, and this is posted as a goal, goal uh, spread knowledge that not everyone is bought, born into sort of standard sexuality. And he has um, another example, and it says, let's talk about him, but the child on the cover looks like a girl, and he's very angry that it says him. And he sort of says, this is the Socialist Party propaganda. Uh, this is what we need to stop. And then he gets elected, but that's not in this video clip. <laughs> so, <laughs> mm. 
So Judith Butler, we are out of the theological realm. We're very much in the political realm here. Well, we are, except that the evangelical movement in Latin America, especially in Brazil, is largely responsible for um, promulgating the anti-gender ideology movement. And Bolsonaro's election was, was um, very strongly supported uh, on the basis of his anti-gender platform um, and, and the evangelical church, which used to be uh, uh, populated by um, um, liberation theologists, is now populated by right-wing evangelicals. And we see this movement in many countries in the world. It's in Germany, it's in Switzerland, it's um, in France, it's also throughout Africa, through the Pentecostal churches. So there is a kind of deep fear that if, um, that if you do not accept that being born as a given sex um, it determines your social, cultural, sexual, and gendered life forever, um, then you are somehow um, either committing nonsense in a, sci in a scientific way, or you are propagating a theory to children that will confuse their minds and make them not understand this basic difference between human beings. Um, I do think uh, that, uh, that Bolsonaro in particular also stands for the patriarchal family. He will oppose abortion. He will oppose feminism. He's also an authoritarian who believes that masculine power should be restored to its rightful place. So he's not just interested in stabilizing the distinction between male and female. He needs that distinction stabilized in order to uh, um, uh, confirm uh, patriarchy as the natural order of things. Um, so. In, in a sense, this is a hierarchical social form that he wants to keep in place and to recover. Um, gen whatever he calls the ideology of gender is a phantasm. He thinks that it will destroy civilization and the family, but the fact of the matter is that gay, lesbian people, trans people, we've been living among straight people for our whole lives. I mean, we're on the bus together, we're not destroying anybody, we're not, we're not bombing buildings, we're not, you know, that's not our, what we do. We just want lives that we can live um, in an open, free, and equal way. But he imagines that extending those democratic rights to people who are LGBTQ and I, intersex people as well, would be the destruction of civilization. He doesn't realize we've been in civilization the whole time and it didn't get destroyed. <laughs> but, but look, I wanna say one more thing, which is that there is this man putting his finger through all these holes, I mean, <laughs> It's a kind of pornography, if yeah. you think about it. But he has that face where he's moralistically denouncing it, but he's doing the act himself. So, I don't know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to read the situation. <laughs> You're making this very difficult for me because now I want to take the place of the national conservative like Jair Bolsonaro and try and argue their point because they get elected in many places these days. Yes. So this is not just one guy. There's a tendency in our times with, which is national conservative and which strives for what we would call or they would call traditional values. What if what they have, the thirst that they can sort of quench is a thirst for what many people have seen as basic units of their group belonging, of their lives. You hear it in Russia, you say people, you hear people say, well, Putin, he protects the family because Yeltsin tore everything down and the family was what kept us up, you know. So the group identities, 
the family, the church, uh, traditional gender roles, these people might say, those things are important in our society. They keep us together. They make us cohesive. And without those that people are tr trying to tear down, it will all sort of fall apart, become chaos. Yes, but I, I don't think anybody's tearing that down, right? I mean, if you have gay and lesbian families, that doesn't tear down the heterosexual family. All it does is say that the heterosexual family is not the only kind of family that there can be. So you've got, you've got queer families, right? <laughs> I mean, there's nothing, nothing, the only thing that is destroyed is the presumption that there's one kind of family. But in fact, there have always been many kinds of kinship, and especially, you know, in migration or post-war societies, kinship, kinship forms have, have emerged that have been very sustaining. And sometimes they're based on family, sometimes they're based on marriage. Now you might say marriage holds a society together fine. There's nothing about, I mean, you know, they sh the, the people who are in straight marriages should be flattered that so many gay people want marriage. It's, a, you know, they want it too. It doesn't destroy heterosexual marriage. It just makes it into one of several kinds of marriage. But, but there are also many people who have important life ties, supporting relationship and kinship associations that are not marriage and not family, right? And those forms of life that are sustaining also have to be acknowledged as such. So I, I don't know why we can't accept that people are sustained in relationships that are interdependent, uh, that take many different social forms. And just because there are many forms, that does not destroy the one form that understands itself as the only form. The other thing I would say um, is that Bolsonaro and even people like Sarkozy, who also ran against gender, Orban is a problem. He shut gender studies in, in Hungary. Um, they do believe they are, uh, they are appealing to traditionalists who want to go back to the way things were. But let's remember that those families that they want to preserve, they weren't, they weren't always great places for some of us to be, right? Some of us were closeted, some of us were killed, some of us were, had to run away, some of us had to uh, lie about who we were. Those families have always been complex sites. They've never been just one thing. So, the real question is how, to, how do we produce environments, whether they're families or modes of kinships that are nonviolent, that are open, that allow people to flourish? Do we want people to flourish? I think we do. Do we want young people to flourish? I think we do. What are the conditions of flourishing? And how do we go about finding them and promoting them? So, um, but, 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 they call it gender or gender ideology, but the fact of the matter is that gender studies, which is part of feminist studies, which is also part of queer studies, is a very complex field. People are arguing all the time. There are many different approaches. There's intersectional, there's materialist, there's psychoanalytic. There are many groups. They have institutes, they have PhDs. It goes on and on and on. There's no one gender ideology, right? The minute we hear gender, ideology, we know somebody uh, is, is, is engaging a phantasm of their own making. But when we hear this kind of political opposition um, that wrongly characterizes gender ideology as, as pedophilia, I mean, it's absolutely wrong, um, they're also opposing abortion. They're op opposing reproductive rights for women. They are opposing gay marriage. They are having a reaction against gay marriage laws and gender identity laws that allow people to decide how to identify in law and, um, and in their public lives. So it's a whole host of progressive moves that's now being reacted against with this uh, opposition to gender. So one has to take it apart and see all the different kinds of movements that are being opposed through this term. 
Sounds like uh, what you just described. I mean, we're here to talk about the future also for gender politics. And yes. Th and this is a future for gender politics. Yes. Are there other more hopeful futures that you see? Well, look, I think we're living in a time of enormous reaction. I mean, some people say we are regressing. We're going back to earlier times and we're losing all of the progress we've made. I'd say we're living in a time of reaction that people who don't want racial equality, who don't want gender equality, who don't want women's rights to choose, who don't want expanded marriage rights, all, they, have, they have taken to the streets, they've, they're voting, they are angry, um, but this is a long struggle. The future of gender politics is a long struggle, so we need to be smarter about what they're opposing and why, to, to understand their fears and reframe what we do in clear ways. It doesn't have to always be super fancy, but reframe what we do in clear ways that can help people understand that, that gender politics, which is feminist, queer, and trans, it's gotta be all those things. It's gotta be anti-racist. It's even gotta be anti-capitalist in my view. <laughs> um, all of these things. No, oh, seriously, you can't, you, can't, you can't be part of a movement for social equality without also being part of a movement for economic equality. And we are seeing massive, massive intensifications of um, differentials between the wealthy and the poor that is, that is unbridled. And even Bolsonaro, he's a neoliberal who wants to deregulate his market and control the structure of the family. And those things go together. And if we had more time, I would talk about that. Just say a few words. We have a minute for that. What, how does that work? That analysis? Well, I mean, in a way, it works because um, so many people no longer have secure work, public support for health, for, for housing, um, for retirement is being withdrawn or made into uh, a, a private enterprise in some way. So people live with enormous economic insecurity, especially in Brazil. Um, so what does he offer them? He offers them the traditional family, and he says, what is making you so anxious, all of you? Gender ideology, <laughs> that's what's making you anxious. <laughs> so, I mean, I actually believe that there's a displacement um, and uh, a shoring up, a fortifying of traditional sexual and gender norms as a way to keep the family in place so that this free market um, ideology can be extended. Um, and we do see that. We also see it uh, linked, I think, with, um, uh, with, with authoritarianism, which reproduces patriarchal power at the level of the state and the family. Uh, and that gives rise to security forces, military police forces that are, are uh, supposed to keep the population uh, disciplined and regulated and have the power to suppress popular protest. So um, I think we have to see the larger picture um, uh, for sure. Uh, my basic point is that um, you can't you can't be for personal liberty without being for freedom for all, and you can't be for my equality without being for social equality. So the whole point is to certainly take stock of our individual lives and identities, but to make of our own struggle a social struggle. The future of gender politics is a long social struggle, but of course we're gonna win because <laughs> We have, I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna win because we have pleasure, hope, desire, love, and imagination on our side. Why not? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen. Great job. Thank you. Lotte Falker, Judith Butler, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. En ægte superstjerne. Tak skal I have, venner, fordi I kommer.